Hello everybody, this is Cynthia Kane, and I would like to welcome you to the first week of UL 100 CB Research Skills, Information, and Technology. You may have had a chance to see my email that I sent out uh, explaining that your professor for this class, Megan Mahoney, uh, is currently undergoing some health issues. And so I will be your instructor for the first week of this class, and then we will see from this point how things go. So I'm really glad to have a chance to visit with you, and I'm so glad that you're in this class. I hope that it winds up being a very productive and uh, very useful class for you. So we're getting ready to start our first week of our eight-week course of Identify. So on your module for Identify in Canvas, you will actually see links to two videos from YouTube. The first is called How False News Can Spread, and the second video is called The Scrapping of Internet Privacy. I would very much like for you to watch these two videos at some point this week, because a lot of this has to do with what we're going to be covering in UL 100 CB. When we think about the first one, how false news can spread, that one is a really impactful video because it shows just how quickly, particularly with the rise of social media, just how quickly news can spread, whether it's true or false. And I want you to think about it in this context. Think about how you're actually getting your news and your information nowadays. I would venture to say that most of you find out about a breaking news story, whether it's local or national or international, simply by going onto your social media. You might get a push notification from Twitter or Facebook if you're on that, or Instagram or some other type of social media. This is how we find out about what's going on in the world and nationally these days. After we find out, then we might feel compelled to go back, say, to Google and perhaps look for more information about that particular news story, whatever happens to be breaking. But the way that we're getting it now is very much through social media. That can be both good and bad. It is so fast to just do a quick tweet or a quick post on social media. And one particular fact, one piece of information might be just a little bit incorrect, but look how fast that's going to travel. And so that's really what this first video is all about, how false news can spread. The second video has to do with the scrapping of internet privacy. That's actually a video, uh, it's an excerpt from Stephen Colbert's show. And it really kind of highlights the fact that we might think that our online information is private. For example, I might feel pretty confident in sending an email, and I might think, well, that's really not going to be shared wrong. That's how fast, again, information can be spread, and also how quickly our online information really isn't private. Think about this in another context. I'm sure that many of you um, are subscribed to a lot of streaming media uh, video services, such as Netflix or Hulu or the streaming video that Amazon Prime offers. Think about this. Whatever you watch on a streaming video service, and basically even uh, YouTube can be this way as well. Whatever you watch, do you ever notice that then you start getting suggestions pushed at you of, well, if you like this show, then you might like this one, or here's another particular topic of interest for a show that might interest you, or a movie. Well, we might think, well, that's kind of nice. Somebody's making those decisions for me, and I wouldn't have discovered these shows or these movies otherwise. But also think about the fact that that's another example of our online information being shared so quickly. So does it really matter? This is something we're going to be focusing on in UL 100 CB. I want you at least to be aware of the fact that it's way too easy to share almost too much of ourselves through online sites. And then how much of that information, our birth dates, our genders, our preferences, lots of different things, where is that being captured and how much of that is being kept and then used for other purposes? So again, just something to think about. So one part of this class is information literacy. And you might think, well, I'm taking this class because it fulfills my general education requirement for information literacy and technology. And that is true. But we really want you to think beyond that as well. Our textbook states that being able to find and use information well 
realize it, it basically it means realizing what you know what you don't know and what you need to learn and thinking about those categories throughout the process so one thing we really want to make clear in this class is that we're not actually going to be teaching you how to use a library more effectively although library skills are certainly part of information literacy we are very much focused on having you be able to use the information that you find, whatever it happens to be, to create new knowledge. So that might be creating a website, which is actually part of what you're going to be doing in this class. I'm sure that many of you have already written research papers or done a project. Some of you may have used free sites such as Wix or Weebly to create websites or blogs. Some of you may be maintaining that right now. But in order to be able to create new knowledge, that closes the loop of information. And that's really something we're going to be focusing upon in UL 100 CB. So there are actually seven pillars of information literacy. And each one of these is actually a chapter in the textbook that we've had you download, our freely available online textbook. Identify, scope, plan, gather, evaluate, manage, and present. So this week we're covering our first two pillars, identify, understanding your information need, and then scope, knowing what is available out there for your research and what it is that you still need to gather, what is it that you still need to learn. There are actually two additional pillars of information literacy that we will also be covering in the class, visual literacy and science literacy. Visual literacy is applying information literacy to visual materials. Now this can be something as very basic as using Snapchat to add a fun filter to your photo, to your selfie, and then sending it out there. Well, that's kind of fun to do. But we also want to think about that in another context. How easy is it then using different filters online to make ourselves look better than supposedly we look in real life? Maybe to make our faces look thinner, to change the color of our hair, change the color of our eyes. That's information literacy in a visual context. Can we actually believe what we see and how does that influence the way we might think about an individual or the way that we think about ourselves? Maybe the way that we think that we should appear as opposed to the way that we really do appear. With science literacy, that's information literacy in the sciences. This is part of verifying the accuracy of information. And that can be something as relatively basic as somebody sending you a post on Facebook about the newest way to lose weight. How accurate is that information and how would you verify that accuracy? We're gonna be teaching you the skills and the questions to consider in terms of critical thinking in sciences as well as visual literacy. So we want you, and this is covered on page eight through 10 of our textbook, to think about research in a little bit of a different way. So I am quite sure that all of you at some time or another have had to make some consumerist decisions. Um, you might have an older phone, for example, and it's starting to die a little bit. And you want to upgrade to a better phone or a nicer phone. But what questions do you have to consider and what actual research do you need to do to identify whether or not that new phone is going to be the best buy for you? Is there something that perhaps is more reliable out there? So that's identifying even a personal need for information. Why do you want to know more about a topic? What do you need to know or why do you need to know about this topic? Think about this as personal and professional. Professional can be writing a research paper or doing a project for a class, but information literacy goes far, far beyond that. We want you to feel comfortable again asking those critical thinking questions for anything that you need to research for your lifelong learning. So again, we're thinking about research in a different way. Also, we want you to understand the context of the information need, and that's scanning the information environment to find out what is already out there about the topic. I'm going to return to the phone. If I need to upgrade to a new phone, I am probably going to ask some of my friends what they're using. Um, and I might even decide, okay, if I've been using an Android phone, do I want to switch to iOS? Do I want to switch to Apple or vice versa? 
what are the strengths, what are the limitations of each operating system? Is a Samsung somehow better than a Motorola or another type of phone out there? What is it that I need? So I'm scanning the information environment. I might look online for reviews. Again, I might ask my friends, my family, what they're already using and whether they're happy with that or not. You need to do that for any type of topic. Scan it to find out what's already out there. Where are my information gaps? Where do I still need to find more information? And then finally, moving from information need to a research question. This is probably going to be more applicable to a research paper or to a project, but again, you can use it for anything personal. What do you already know about the topic? Again, in terms of the phone, hopefully I can identify what my most crucial needs are. Am I more concerned with texting? Am I more concerned with having a phone that will support uh, games, if I play a lot of games? If I like to have a lot of other apps on my phone, then what type of memory requirements do I need? Do I need a bigger screen or do I, am I okay just you know, with a smaller screen? What am I doing most with my phone? That goes into what I already know about my topic and then formulating what it is that I need to find out more about. Finding a research question or a thesis statement tends to, again, to be more in terms of a research paper or a research project. But when you do that, you start to focus a little bit more on what it is that I really need to know about and what information sources are out there that will help me find out more. So we're going to go to a little exercise on mapping a strategy for finding information. Now, you probably know that the topic of electronic cigarettes has been uh, very much in the news now, like uh, banning the use of electronic cigarettes in certain group, age groups, or different audiences. That might be something that I would really find, want to find out more information about, um, because some people also might make the argument that electronic cigarettes are somehow better than regular cigarettes because, you know, supposedly maybe you're taking in less nicotine, but as we're finding out, are the juices, the chemicals that are used in electronic cigarettes, are those actually more harmful? So that would be what I would want to find out about. What would be a personal need for this information? Maybe I know someone or maybe I have a family member who's trying to quit smoking and I want to help that family member find out more information about electronic cigarettes as opposed to other ways of getting away just from regular tobacco or regular smoking. So that could be a personal need. What would be the context of this information need? Again, who am I trying to help and what is it that I really want to focus on? Am I looking more for health perspectives? Am I looking more for social reasons to quit smoking? What is it that I'm looking for? What's the context? And finally, a research question that could lead to a thesis statement. I really want to go beyond this. Are electronic cigarettes better than regular cigarettes? Because better is such a relative term. You know, what does that even mean? So I am probably going to have to focus a little bit more on, again, the perspectives of the topic that I want to actually find out more about. And there are some ways that you can do this that really don't take very long at all. There is a technique that is called concept mapping, and this may or may not be familiar to you all. It can be done on paper, or you can uh, go online using a site such as Bubble Us, and we're going to look at Bubble Us in just a second. So what we're going to do with Bubble Us is that we're going to identify a topic. We're going to identify different perspectives that affect that topic. Then we're going to identify the sources that are needed to help support or find out more about that perspective or more than one perspective. And then finally, we have to figure out how we're going to find those sources of information. So I'm going to switch my screen here. And we're going to go into Bubble Us. So you can see the address up there on the screen. Now, Bubble Us is a free program. Um, you can create up to three concept maps or three mind maps online with a free account. You can register for a free account here, and you can either sign in with a username and a password, 
or if you have Facebook, you can sign in through Facebook as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on sign in because I've already done this before. And you can sign in with Google or you can sign in with Facebook. And I'm going to show you how I could use Bubble Us just to take a few seconds to think about my topic and those perspectives and those sources. And once I do something like this, it makes research a lot easier and I think a lot less overwhelming. So I'm going to click on my plus button. And here, I can even do some formatting if I want. Or I can make my text size a little bit bigger. I'm actually going to do that so you can see that a little bit better. And I'm just going to type in electronic cigarettes. There we go. So I'm now going to click on this plus sign here. And this layer is actually where I can start looking at my different perspectives for my topic. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger again. So one perspective could be social, maybe as in social pressure, like social pressure to quit smoking. We're going to go back over here and I'm going to click. and add another layer for my perspective. Health issues. What are health issues involved in using electronic cigarettes? Do they help somebody quit smoking? Are they more dangerous than actual uh, tobacco? What's going on there? And we're gonna add a third one. We'll click here again. And I'm going to do psychological factors. And the reason I'm doing that is that psychology can have a lot to do with smoking in the first place, whether it's electronic cigarettes or regular cigarettes. Um, using either one, some people might argue that that helps to relieve stress. Some others might argue that it actually increases stress because it lowers our um, heart rate. It might actually lower our, um, basically our immunity to different diseases and so forth. So I have health, psychological, and social. So you see that really didn't take me very long at all. So those are my perspectives. I have my topic here, and then I have my perspectives. Now let's go to social pressure. And we're, what, what we're going to add here will be our third layer, which are the sources that we need. So in other words, what information sources are gonna get me more information about these different perspectives? So in terms of social, I might want to check into maybe online groups. about smoking. And that could be a lot of different things. It could be something like um, associations, maybe websites about associations for quitting smoking. Um, I might also be able to find maybe some chat boards or discussion boards um, that talk about the use of electronic cigarettes. So I'm kind of getting more um, personal perspectives that way as well. I could also though, go back over here, Add another layer. And I might want sociological journal articles. So that would be a little bit more scholarly in approach. So again, what I'm doing here is just thinking about the types of sources that are going to help me find more information about these perspectives. Health issues. Again. Maybe something like
associations or organizations concerning smoking. Maybe health magazines. And then I could continue to do the same thing with the psychological factors. That last layer then will be, how am I going to find these sources? Um, in a few weeks, we're gonna get into primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. So actually this, this last layer is more of a tertiary source. The sources that I need in order to find online groups or to find sociological journal articles or to find health magazines. So certainly, Google would help me here as a source of information. And sociological journal articles, I could use and I'll be learning about this later on. Google Scholar, which can help you find more scholarly journal articles online. One of the difficulties for Google Scholar is that it doesn't always give you the full text of articles, but it certainly can be a start. And if you're affiliated with the library, which you are as an ESU student, you could also use a sociology journals database from the library. So again, you see that didn't take me very long at all. This is a concept map or a mind map. And if you just take a few minutes to do this with the topic that you're researching, think about the perspectives, the sources of information you're going to need to find information about those perspectives, and then the sources that you're going to need, the resources that will help you find these sources of information, that is actually mapping a research strategy in advance. And that can save you so much time in the long run. Again, this is all identifying information. So we are in our first pillar, identify. Thank you for watching our first video tutorial. You are now ready to watch our next one on scope. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough. It is absolutely crucial that you watch all the video tutorials before you start working on the engagement activities and the learning assessment for this week's module. So I will see you for the next one.